Good morning everybody, Pastor Drew from Lighthouse Church. It's fantastic that you could join us today for, for our um, monthly communion service. Kerry and I trust and hope that you're doing well and we're praying for you. And on the subject of, of praying, we have put together these cards and you may recognize these cards, but we've repurposed them with a message on the back asking people if they need hope in these unpredictable times. Now it's about prayer. And so we're asking these prayer cards that we're gonna pop through people's doors in our immediate vicinity that where we live and around Hope House. And if you'd like some of them, please let me know uh, and you can arrange to pick some up from Hope House. I'm hoping to put some in the, in the front porch area of Hope House. So you can adopt your street uh, and pop some of these through and then we will let you know if people contact us and you can pray for them along with us. So don't forget, if you'd like some of those, please let me know. Well, today we have um, a message from Pastor Steve. Now, for many of you will know that we are part of the All Nations Movement. Um, and Pastor Steve, Steve leads that movement. Now, Kerry and I are privileged to come underneath his apostolic covering as our pastor, and we get many things from that, including support, encouragement, discipleship, mentoring. But one of the most important things of all is we belong to the All Nations family. And that's really our tribe. Those are the people that we run with on this journey following Jesus Christ. As we're part of that movement now, we get four apostolic messages from Pastor Steve every year, to which today's is the first message of 2021. So grab your Bibles, a pad and a paper, because you will not want to miss this message. It's an incredibly powerful message. But before we hear the word, I just want to lead us through into a time of worship. And that includes an opportunity not only for um, our bringing our, our sacrifice of praise, but also bringing our gifts, tithes and offerings. And if you're unsure how to do that, then on screen will be some information on how to do that and lead you to the web page with more details. And then we move on to our devotion time, which we make uh, some time and some space for some thoughts. And we have a message again from uh, uh, Steve at Miracle Street and, and another couple of other videos, which should just give us some time for reflection. And then we move on to, to message from Pastor Steve. But if this blesses you, please don't forget to, to like the message, uh, the, the, the video, because that helps the, the YouTube algorithms to, to boost the video and get that message out to other people who may not normally see this. And if you if not, you, you can share that video, but also subscribe to make sure that you don't miss out on any other content. And finally, let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, as we come before your throne, we set our hearts, our minds and souls on you. We take this time to remember you and what you did for us on Calvary. And we remember the words of the great Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 verses 26 through to 32. Let me go over with you again exactly what goes on in the Lord's Supper and why it is so centrally important. I received my instructions from the master himself and passed them on to you. The master Jesus on his night betrayal took bread having given thanks he broke it and said this is my body broken for you do this in remembrance to me. After supper he did the same thing this cup is my blood my new covenant with you each time you drink this cup remember me. What you must solemnly realise is that every time you eat this bread and every time you drink this cup, you reenact the words and actions, the death of the master. You will be drawn back to this meal again and again until the master returns. You must never let familiarity breed contempt. Anyone who eats the bread or drinks the cup of the master irreverently is like part of the crowd that jeered and spit on him in his death. It is those, that kind of remembrance that you want to be part of. Examine your motives, test your heart and come to his meal in holy awe. If you give no thought or words, don't care about your broken body, the master, when you eat or drink, you are running the risk of serious consequences. And that is why so many of you now are even are listless and sick and the others have gone to an early grave. If we get this straight now, we won't have to be straightened out later on. Better to be confronted by the master now than face a fiery confrontation later. Amen. And Heavenly Father, we, we bring our ties to you also as an act of holy obedience. And you bless them as you commanded us in Malachi 3 verse 10. Bring the full amount of your ties into the temple so there will be plenty of food there. Put me to the test and you will see that I will open the windows of heaven and pour out you an abundance of all good things. 
So we bring this time to you in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.
And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you.
cast my life like ashes on the waves and leave behind all of my selfish ways my past is gone now all that's left is grace to live is christ to die is gain i have been crucified with christ it is no longer i who lives but christ That train track is four foot eight and a half inches wide. It's been reproduced all over the world, nearly a million miles of the stuff. The guys who built the early railways inherited the workshops and the equipment that was used to build the earlier stagecoaches and four foot eight and a half inches was the spacing of the wheels. It needed to be that way or the wheels would break in the ruts that were cut on the old English dirt tracks that date back to the Roman invasion. The tracks became the roads, the roads became the railways. So four foot eight and a half inches is the specification of a Roman war chariot that dates back to Julius Caesar 65 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. He was the only one who lived according to God's original blueprint for human life. 
and then he died on a cross to pay the penalty for all of us who have not lived up to God's plan. By accepting that truth, your life can be restored to God's original design. What if I told you Jesus came to abolish religion? What if I told you voting Republican really wasn't his mission? What if I told you Republican doesn't automatically mean Christian and just because you call some people blind doesn't automatically give you vision? I mean, if religion is so great, why has it started so many wars? Why does it build huge churches but fails to feed the poor? Tell single moms God doesn't love them if they've ever had a divorce, but in the Old Testament, God actually calls religious people whores. Religion might preach grace, but another thing they practice, tend to ridicule God's people, they did it to John the Baptist. They can't fix their problems and so they just mask it, not realizing religion's like spraying perfume on a casket. See, the problem with religion is it never gets to the core. It's just behavior modification, like a long list of chores. Like, let's dress up the outside, make it look nice and neat, but it's funny, that's what they used to do to mummies while the corpse rots underneath. Now I ain't judging, I'm just saying, quit putting on a fake look. Because there's a problem if people only know that you're a Christian by your Facebook. I mean, in every other aspect of life, you know that logic's unworthy. It's like saying you play for the Lakers just because you bought a jersey. See, this was me too, but no one seemed to be on to me. Acting like a church kid while addicted to pornography. See, on Sunday I'd go to church, but Saturday getting faded, acting if I was simply created to just have sex and get wasted. See, I spent my whole life building this facade of neatness, but now that I know Jesus, I boast in my weakness. Because if grace is water, then the church should be an ocean. It's not a museum for good people, it's a hospital for the broken. Which means I don't have to hide my failure, I don't have to hide my sin. Because it doesn't depend on me, it depends on Him. See, because when I was God's enemy, and certainly not a fan, He looked down and said, I want that man. Which is why Jesus hated religion and for it he called them fools. Don't you see so much better than just following some rules? Now let me clarify. I love the church, I love the Bible, and yes, I believe in sin. But if Jesus came to your church, would they actually let him in? See, remember he was called a glutton and a drunkard by religious men. But the Son of God never supports self-righteousness, not now, not then. Now back to the point, one thing is vital to mention how Jesus and religion are on opposite spectrums. See, one's the work of God, but one's a man-made invention. See, one is the cure, but the other's the infection. See, because religion says do, Jesus says done. Religion says slave, Jesus says son. 
Religion puts you in bondage while Jesus sets you free. Religion makes you blind, but Jesus makes you see. And that's why religion and Jesus are two different clans. Religion is man searching for God. Christianity is God searching for man, which is why salvation is freely mine and forgiveness is my own. Not based on my merits, but Jesus' obedience alone. Because he took the crown of thorns and the blood dripped down his face. He took what we all deserve. I guess that's why you call it grace. And while being murdered, he yelled, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Because when he was dangling on that cross, he was thinking of you. And he absorbed all your sin and he buried it in the tomb, which is why I'm kneeling at the cross saying, come on, there's room. So for religion, no, I hate it. In fact, I literally resent it. Because when Jesus said, it is finished, I believe he meant it. Well, special greetings to you today. I'm absolutely delighted to be able to share from God's Word with our All Nations Movement family. I know we're spread out in many different geographical locations, uh, and yet we are joined by God's Spirit in purpose, uh, in vision, in seeking God for revival. uh, And relationally, there's a joining with so many. Uh, It's a work of the Spirit, it's supernatural, and it gives me tremendous joy, responsibility, delight. I mean, the words are so many in my own heart as I consider what God is doing on the earth at this moment and that we have a part to play in God's purposes. And our theme as a local church uh, this year is uh, Jesus people. I really believe that God is raising people who are fascinated with his son, who are focused on the teaching of Christ, the words of Christ, the person of Christ, and are caught up into the mission of Christ as well. Uh, One of the phrases that keeps coming to mind is Jesus' people are emerging. And sometimes when we say a phrase like that, we think somewhere in the future, maybe people who are better than us. And I was just reminded this morning, the Lord said, he's not looking for another generation. This is the generation, you are the people. And sometimes I wanna make excuses and I speak to people who make excuses, saying, well, I don't know if I'm good enough. I stumbled. Uh, My commitments weren't everything I wanted them to be. And I was reminded of the passage in 1 Corinthians chapter one, verse 26, where the apostle Paul says, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards, Not many were influential, not many were of noble birth, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. It's not encouraging, it encourages me. Verse 28, God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. I think it's a powerful little passage. It's a reminder. God doesn't look for ability. God doesn't look at gifting. God doesn't look at nobility. You know, where have you come from? What roots do you have? God looks for availability. And his track record is always that he chooses the lowly, the despised, the poor, those who wouldn't choose themselves, those that others would say, that person would never do that. And he says, I pick you. So a reminder, there are a Jesus people emerging. And when I say that, it's you, it's me. We are works in progress, not yet arrived, but aiming at perfection for our lives to look like the very life of Christ on the earth. And so I pray that be an encouragement to you. Uh, Enoch prophesied about our, this generation, coming. In Jude and verse 14, it says, Enoch, 
the seventh from Adam prophesied about these people, I see the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones. So the Lord is coming. We are, and he's raising this generation. We are that generation. Let me just pause for a moment and just ask the Holy Spirit to bring that as a reality and revelation right now to you. Whatever week you've had, however your days have gone, however the enemy may have accused you and said you're not good enough, you keep falling or stumbling. Father, I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would give those who are watching today the the truth, the reality that they are chosen by you. They are called into Christ. They are his children. And I pray that the lies of the enemy, the stumbling and falling would all melt away as the strength of Christ is evidenced in us. And we begin to walk with greater strength and consistency, knowing that Christ is our righteousness, our wisdom, our holiness, and he's our strength. I pray right now every argument of the enemy would melt away and you would realize that you're a son and a daughter of the living God today in Jesus name. I really felt importantly that God wanted you to know that you were loved, you were called and this is the moment uh, for us as a generation for you and your your issues don't disqualify you. you. We get up again, we move towards what he has. I also want to read to you from Isaiah 40, about two and a half years ago, two years ago. This was a key scripture in much of what we were doing. And uh, I just really felt the Lord impress it upon me today. And I'm not going to preach on it, but I want to declare it. It's from uh, uh, Isaiah prophesying, uh, prophesying about the coming of Christ and the coming of one before Christ who would prepare the way for Christ, which is John the Baptist. So it was a prophecy about what John would come and do. And it parallels in our day as we are waiting for the King to come. And I would declare Jesus, King Jesus is coming. He's coming in a powerful way. He's coming in a harvest way. He's coming in a revival way. Uh, In the Amplified Version, it just simply says a voice of one calling out, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness, remove the obstacles, make straight and smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up and every mountain and hill be made low. Let the rough ground become a plain, in other words, smooth, and the rugged places a broad valley. And the glory and majesty and splendor of the Lord will be revealed in our generation. And all humanity shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Prepare the way for the Lord. Paths being made straight, the rough way smooth, uh, crooked way straight in Jesus' name. The King is coming. Prepare by intercession, prepare by repentance, prepare by hungering and thirsting. The Spirit and the Bride are saying, come, Lord Jesus, come. And I believe that's our cry. That's what God is doing. So it's in that context, I'm going to speak to you for a few moments. It's the context of that you are a chosen people. You are the emerging Jesus people and that we are preparing the way for the King to come. And I would also say introductory remark from Psalm 24, this key verse that just simply says, lift up your heads, O you gates. And I've had this going through my heart and mind personally. I say it to you today, God wants you to lift up your head. Some of us have been walking with our head down. We've been cast down and the Lord is saying, it's time for you to look up. It's time for you to breathe deep. It's time for you to know who you are, what you were called to, that you were chosen by me. So I want to say, lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors. The King of glory is coming. That's Psalm 24. And I pray that that would become your reality. No more stumbling all the time. No more anxiously looking down. No more intimidation, but a confidence rooted in King Jesus, who really is our righteousness, our holiness. He's our strength. He's the wisdom that we need. He's the peace that is ours. Everything we need is in Christ. He's the daily bread we feed on. He's the living water we drink from. He becomes our vision and our sight. 
So you are, I am an emerging generation of Jesus people preparing the way for the King to come. And we must lift up our heads. It's time to look up for our salvation is drawing ever nearer. These are significant moments in our lives and in the life of the earth, in the plan of the mission of God on the earth. All introduction, here's where I'm going today. Jesus people, and this doesn't sound like an exciting title, but I just felt the Lord saying, Jesus people who will die to themselves, or a Jesus people who are dying to live. Uh, There's lots of different ways of saying it, but what I've really sensed the Lord saying in my heart and mind is that the great fruitfulness, authority, walking in the peace of God, walking in the rest of God, knowing freedom like we've never known before is absolutely connected to the process of dying. So on one hand, we have fruitfulness, we have power, we have authority, we are free from what anybody thinks about us, from the pressures around us, persecution may come, rejection might come, and yet we live absolutely free, blessed, like in Matthew 5, the, the description and the characteristics of the Beatitudes in the end time generation. It's a vibrant heart, blessed are those, blessed are those, blessed are those. But I'm realizing the blessing, the freedom, the power, the fruit is absolutely connected to a dying. And the Lord is calling us into a place of dying. So don't switch off in your mind thinking, I don't need a message about dying, but instead lean in because this could be the very message you need today to help sort out lots of things that are offshoot issues because there's maybe never been a death process. The Lord is inviting us into a deeper walk. He's inviting us into greater authority, greater fruitfulness. And he's really saying, come, follow my example, because I led the way into this. Jesus calls us to die. John 12, 24 to 26, it says, very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. If you don't die, you just remain alone, one. And yet, he says, but if it dies, it produces many seeds. He's talking about his own life. He's talking about the cross and that he's going to have to die and be buried and there's going to be much fruit. He will be the first of many that will be raised from the dead. This is our gospel. And then he switches from talking about what's going to happen to him. And he says, anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. So he calls us to die. He speaks about himself, but he says, actually, anyone who loves their life in this world will lose it. But if you will lose your life in this world, in that way you gain eternal life. I want to encourage us today to consider, as I was praying about this this morning, I kept hearing the Lord because I love application to things. I like to have a, a meaty application. And I felt the Lord saying, the big application all the way through the message today is to consider the words of the King. So he's saying anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And whoever serves me must follow me, his example, and where I am, my servant also will be. And my father will honor the one who serves me. It's worth making a note of these or downloading the notes afterwards and spending time considering the words of Jesus. So firstly, Jesus calls us to die. Secondly, Jesus leads us by his own example. Philippians 2, 5 to 8. It's a very popular scripture in our circles, at least. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. The message, Peterson 
he says he didn't try and hold on to the privileges of deity. He let them go. He remained 100% God, but the privileges associated to his godness, he laid aside those privileges. He became a man, made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. So not only does he call us to die, lose our lives, but he himself from the very get-go, from the beginning, he showed us what it looked like to lay aside privilege to take on servanthood and even to go to the cross and die for other people. Made himself nothing, took on the nature of a servant, became obedient to death. This flies in the face of the culture of our day. We are self-protecting. We want our rights, we want to be treated a particular way, we want to be seen, we want to be thanked, we want to be valued. We want people to know, we want to make our mark on the earth, we want, our, we want to leave, and he's saying, lose it all. Lose it all for my kingdom and come follow me. It is a counter-cultural kingdom with a counter-cultural king who calls us to die and he led the way by becoming a servant himself. And Jesus, in fact, many times said this phrase, but in John 5, 19, he says, even the son, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees the father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. I'm not living for myself, he says. I only do what I see the father doing. Dead to self, alive to the will of the father. Could there be a generation like this emerging on the earth again who look like Jesus, who say, I do nothing. I can do nothing unless I see the Father doing it. In other words, I live under submission to the Father's plan and purpose. You know, God's, uh, this is a twisted, perverted way of thinking in the, in the church world. We think God is there to make our lives easier we think God is there to tell me what my great destiny is. And it's all twisted and on its head. We are alive to serve his purpose. He's the one with the story. He's the one with the mission. And he's the one who creates us and says, now come, serve my story. You have the privilege of being caught up into my mission. Lose your life in my bigger picture. And if you lose your life, you'll really find it. And in the light of eternity, eternity, it will really matter. And my Father will honor those who serve me, said Jesus. Isn't that powerful? But it's an upside down kingdom. So rather than me looking for my thing to do on the earth, I ask him, what's your thing? And how do I get involved in what you are doing? Because at the end of the day, your story is bigger than my story. And I'm not trying to leave a name or a mark for myself. I want to serve King Jesus well. So Jesus calls us to die. Jesus leads us by example. He tells us he can only do what he sees his father doing. In the garden in Gethsemane, Matthew 26, he says these words, uh, verse 37 onwards. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. This is a very critical moment in the ministry and life of Jesus. He began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here, keep watch with me. And going a little farther, fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Verse 42, he went to a second time and prayed, my father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away, unless I drink it, may your will be done. I love reading that because you see the tension. Jesus will obey the Father. He delights in obeying the Father, but he's not looking forward to the cross. He set his face that way. He told us, for this purpose was I born, and yet at the time when it came, great sorrow, trouble. He shed drops of blood from his forehead. He was in anguish over this. This dying piece isn't as easy as we think. It's not a romantic, poetic thing. It's our will crossing with God's will. 
and our will dies and we say, Lord, your will come to pass. What you want is better than what I want. Not my will, but your will be done. I believe a generation who would wrestle that through, it doesn't happen in an altar call. It won't happen in a one-time message. It won't happen in a one-time prayer meeting. This is a wrestling with God. It, I won't read it, but in my notes at the end, when you look at them, I'll put an excerpt in uh, from the life of uh, the intercessor, Reese Howell, how over a six-day period, he wrestled this very issue with God in prayer and in fasting and saying to God, I don't want to lose my name. I don't want to lose finances. I don't want to lose everything I've built. It's a big ask that you're asking God. But the wrestling with God actually birthed a fruitfulness as he died to himself. I think sometimes we've produced followers of Christ, Christians, whatever you want to call them, converts, very quickly. And they haven't weighed up what it means to serve the living Christ. They've not counted the cost. I believe it's time to count the cost. Our will will cross with God's will. And it does result in sorrow, anguish, trouble in our own hearts. Do I really want to let go? Will I really surrender? But when you pass through those moments, when you pass through your own garden of Gethsemane, when you pass through that moment like Reese Howell, when you go through your own moments like the, the Apostle Peter did, like the Apostle Paul did, you will come out the other end and the freedom you will know, the joy you will know, and the usefulness to the master from your life will be well worth the struggle. Jesus bids us come die and yet in doing that if we say yes he's actually saying come live like you've never lived before so Jesus bids us to die he's our example thirdly I want to read you some of the words of the apostle Paul remember he planted churches raised the dead cast out demons wrote so much of the new testament he was used greatly by God I believe has great reward in the light of eternity today and yet when I read his words, I see a man who had died. He laid aside everything. He was trained in the greatest university of his day at the feet of Gamaliel. He knew the Bible. He knew Old Testament prophecy. He knew New Testament reality of that prophecy. And yet he says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7, Whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. It's, it's powerful. I want to know Christ, he said. I want to gain Christ. Verse 10, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And Paul continues, not that I have already attained this, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. You see a man in love with Christ, dead to himself, reaching for the more, of having Christ alive in him. In Galatians 6, 14, Paul says these words, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Oh, would Christians hear that word today? May I never boast. All of social media and all of our platforms lean into boasting. They're useful, they're tools, they're platforms that can bring God great glory, but they can also be problematic in that if we're not dead to self, there can be much boasting that takes place. We can boast by what we drive, we can boast by the way that we live, we boast by, we can flaunt anything. And yet Paul says, 
He says, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through whom or through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Just a few chapters earlier in in Galatians 2.20, he said, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Can you say that? I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Wow. That generation, that kind of Jesus people are emerging. They're coming. They're rising. Young and old, people who have been saved a while, those who are just turning to Christ, And they're going to be able to say, like the Apostle Paul, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. Let me give you two examples from history. I just like their quotes. Uh, One is Catherine Coleman, uh, one of my heroes. She walked in tremendous Holy Spirit power, tremendous fruitfulness. And yet, when you look at her life, there's also a lot of misunderstanding. People misunderstood her. She'd been through the, the pain and the death of divorce. And yet God used her after that season, even before, more than she was used before. And somebody asked her, what does it cost to have this kind of power flowing through your life? And her response to the question was, it costs everything, but it's worth it. I want to say this generation are going to know what it is to pay a high cost, but they will say it costs everything, but it's worth it. When Wigglesworth, another one of my heroes, was asked about the power of God in his life and how he has it, what he's been through, he said, before God could bring me to this place, he has broken me a thousand times. These like precious faith, this like precious faith for, is for all of us. But there may be some hindrances in your life that God will have to deal with. It seems to me as if if a a thousand road engines came over my life, trains or cars, uh, to break me up like the potter's vessel. There is no other way into the deep things of God but a broken spirit. There is no other way into the power of God. God will do the exceedingly abundantly above all if we, that we can ask or think for us. He can bring us to that place where we can say with Paul, so God can do it, if we can say with Paul, I live no longer. Another, even Christ, has taken the reins. I put another large quote in by him and I'd encourage you to read that. Lastly, I want to say to us, Jesus is still calling. Not only I started with that he's calling, but I'm ending with his words still stand true today. In Mark 8, verse 34, Jesus said, call the crowd to him and he said, if anyone would come after me, they must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous, sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him or her when he comes in his Father's glory with his holy angels. If you want to come after me, deny yourself. I spent some time thinking about that phrase, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. It's talking about the example of Jesus. He lived on this earth as though he was a pilgrim and many Christians are living as though they're here forever. You're not here forever, this life is short. This is the womb of the morning. Stop living as though you are rooted here for eternity. It's a, it's a, it's a, a a non-believing way of thinking. It's how those who are not following Christ think. I'm going to make the most of this life because they don't have a hope for another life. For us who are followers of Christ, this life is preparation for that life. We handled this one well, temporary, faithfully, following Christ, denying ourselves. It prepares us for the life that is coming. And Jesus says, come, follow me. But if you want to, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Don't be ashamed of my words. Don't be ashamed of my, of my ways. Don't be ashamed of my leadership. Don't be offended at me. He said that as a message to John the Baptist. Blessed is he who's not offended at me. 
He's got a high call, but the reward too is high. When you follow him and you do what he says. So I ask you a question in closing. Have you ever seriously considered... You may have gone to church for 20 years. You may be tuning in for the first time today. But have you ever considered the words of Jesus? If anyone would come after me, you want to call yourself a Christian? You want to be this Christ follower? Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Lose your life and take on my life. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Would you consider that? Would you spend a day thinking about it? Would you wrestle with it? Would you pray with somebody else over those words? I don't think we need another altar call. I don't think we need somebody else to lay hands on us right now. I think we need to seriously consider the words of Jesus because King Jesus bids us come and die. I will finish with one last example from history of a man who considered that question as you consider it yourself. It's George Muller, who 200 years ago had a church of 1,200 before there were mega churches. His, his ministry was fruitful. He had a printing, publishing house, sending literature of the Bible all over the world. He did three world tours preaching after the age of 70. I mean, crazy what one man's life can bear. But what he's most famously known for is building orphan houses. Uh, I think there was five houses at one time in Bristol holding in those big, big things, 2,000 uh, children at any one time, more than 10,000 passed through. It's, it's the fruit of his life, the power of his life, the intimacy with Jesus, the miraculous in provision that came through, the power of his preaching. And yet he relates it all back to this. And he says, there was a day when I died, died to myself, my opinions, preferences, tastes, and will. That's his first death. His second death, I died to the world. It's approval or censure. And then third death, I died to the approval or blame even of brothers, Christian friends. And since then, I have studied only to show myself approved unto God. Isn't that amazing? He said there was a day he'd wrestled with it. I don't know how long that wrestling took place. I don't know how the Lord had him over that. But he came to a place where he died to himself, he died to the world, he died to the approval even of the Christian world and learned to live for the approval of God. Jesus comes us, beckons us, come and die. Let me pray for you. Father, I pray for everybody watching today that as they wrestle with this and think about setting aside time, that they would remember there is emerging a Jesus generation, people who are broken, but you call us to yourself and to your purpose, that the King is coming. And that we are called to lift up our heads, but then you are beckoning us to consider your words, come and die, deny yourself, take up your cross. I pray that we would wrestle with these truths and say yes to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow, Pastor, thank you for that anointed word. I trust and pray that all of you were blessed by that message as much as I was. And that's the third time now that I've watched it. I have the notes that Pastor Steve spoke about in the message. So if you'd like a copy of those, please let me know and I can email those to you. But before you go, and if I can just take a few more moments of your time, I'd just like to pull out a few things that Pastor Steve had said. The first one being that God's not looking for a new generation. We are the new generation. What a privilege to be. God loves the lowly and, and the despised. He chose you and me. We, we are Jesus people, albeit work in progress. We are Jesus people nevertheless. The third point that I pulled out was your past does not disqualify you. Declare it and lift it up. No matter what we have done as we come to Jesus and he washes us clean, we are qualified by being part of his kingdom. We have been tasked to prepare the way for Jesus. Much like John the Baptist, who's, who carries my wife's um, hero, biblical hero next to Jesus, obviously, we have been tasked to pave the way for Jesus. Pastor Steve then went on to mention four points in particular, uh, which we need to make note of. Jesus calls us to die, die to ourselves. Then the second one, Jesus leads the way by an example. He physically died for us. 
and then the Apostle Paul imitated Jesus. And finally, Jesus still calls today. In Mark 8, 34, it says these words. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, before I let you go, I have one more video for you. Please watch it. It's the most important message in the world, even for those of us who think we already know it. Be blessed and highly favoured. God be with you until we meet again. The Four Points is a really simple overview of the Bible and the first thing that you need to know is that God loves you. He's crazy about you. His love for you is unlimited and unconditional. That means there's nothing that you can do to make God love you any more or less than he does right now. Not only does God love you, he has an amazing plan and purpose for your life. That's why he's desperate to have a relationship with you. He doesn't want you to miss out on the incredible future that he has for you. There is nothing that God wants more than to love and be loved by you. Sadly, we've been separated from God's amazing love by something the Bible calls sin. Simply put, sin is when we choose to live for ourselves rather than God. We sin when we ignore God, we break his laws and basically do things our own way. Sin destroys relationships with friends, with family and with God. So instead of living the incredible life that God intended, the Bible says that sin has brought misery, pain and ultimately death. The third point is probably one of the most well-known facts in the history of mankind. What's important to realise is the penalty for sin is death, separation from God, both now and forever. The Bible says we've all sinned and we all deserve to die. But God, who is full of mercy, loved you so much that he sent Jesus to come and die in your place. When Jesus died, he made a way for us to spend eternity with God. You see, not only did Jesus die for our sin, three days later, he rose again from the dead. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus has defeated sin and death and made a way for us to have a brand new life in relationship with God. All we need to do is accept that we've sinned, ask for God's forgiveness, put our faith in Jesus and decide to live the rest of our lives only for him. The choice is yours.